Chapter 6, Part 1 of 3. On the Border You are in American territory, a Border Patrol agent shouts through a bullhorn. Turn back. Sometimes Enrique strips and wades into the Rio Grande to cool off and wash away the sweat and grime, but the bullhorn always stops him. He goes back. Thank you for returning to your country. Enrique is stymied. For days, he has been stuck in Nuevo Laredo. He has been watching, listening, and trying to plan. Somewhere across this milky green ribbon of water is his mother. Enrique embraces the campsite as his temporary new home. It is safer for him than anywhere else in Nuevo Laredo, a city of half a million residents. It is swarming with La Migra and all kinds of police. The camp is at the bottom of a narrow winding path that slopes to the river. A clump of reeds hides it from the U.S. immigration authorities' constant surveillance. Enrique shares a soiled, soggy mattress with three other migrants. Still others lie on pieces of cardboard. For their clothing, they use the closet, a wire spring standing upright from a mattress stripped of everything but its coils. Each resident of the camp has a space on one of the bare coils on which to hang his shirt and pants. The leader of the river camp is El Terindero. He usually wants drugs or beer as payment for letting migrants stay in his camp. He is a kind of coyote, or smuggler, known as a patero. He smuggles people into the United States by pushing them across the river on inner tubes while paddling like a pato, or duck. In addition to smuggling, El Terindoro tattoos people and sells clothing migrants have left on the riverbank to make money for drugs. When the drugs take hold, El Terindoro hallucinates. Sometimes he is so slowed by heroin that he can barely stand up or move. The campsite has become a home for migrants, smugglers, drug addicts, and criminals. Some are just passing through, staying only a few days. Others have been stuck there for months, waiting for the right time to sneak across the border. One migrant, a fellow Honduran, has lived on the river for seven months. He has been caught every time he tried entering the United States. He has descended into depression and a life of glue-sniffing, he says. Enrique listens. The migrants here call Enrique El Hongo, the mushroom, because he is quiet, soaking everything in. Enrique clings to the camp where he is protected. Because he is so young, everyone at the camp looks after him. When he leaves during the day, someone walks him through the brush to the road and always yells, Be careful! They warn him against heroin. They offer tips on which parts of the city are thick with police, places he should avoid. Each week, El Terindoro gives police officers who patrol the river a 10% cut of his earnings as a smuggler. Because of these bribes, the police show leniency toward anyone at the camp. Nonetheless, police still regularly show up at the river and check migrants' pockets for drugs, and they help themselves to whatever changes there. They pick on the migrants because they figure they can get away with it. Sometimes, Enrique is too afraid to venture into Nuevo Laredo to drink from the fa a faucet in the park. He takes water from the river, which carries raw sewage to, from dozens of towns. People tell him of a superstition. Drink from the Rio Bravo, and you'll be stuck in Nuevo Laredo forever. He risks it anyway. The water tastes heavy, but it does not make him sick. The camp is a hard place for Enrique to sleep in. It is noisy all night with the sounds of migrants coming and going as they try to cross the river. U.S. Border Patrol bo bullhorns bark, warning them back. Enrique can hear cars at a U.S. entry checkpoint a few blocks away. All around is the smell of excrement from goats and the, from the campers, whose bathroom is the surrounding grass. The camp is strewn with trash. Red ants cover the ground, and millions of gnats hover over the river. In the daytime, it is scorching hot. At night, Enrique gazes across the Rio Grande at the United States. Before him, on the American side of the border, he can see a church steeple, train tracks, and three antennas with blinking red lights. It is almost May 2000, nearly two months since Enrique left home the last time. Enrique has spent 47 days bent on nothing but surviving. This is his eighth attempt to reach the north. He has pushed forward 1,800 miles. By now, his mother must have called Honduras again. The family must have told her that he was gone. His mother must be worrying. He has to telephone her to let her know that he is coming soon. The last time he spoke to her, she was in North Carolina. He has no idea if she is still there, or where that is, or how to reach it. He's, he used telephones so rarely in Honduras that he didn't even think to memorize his mother's number in case his scrap of paper was taken from him or lost. Happily, he remembers one number back home, at a tire store where he worked. He will call and ask his old employer to find his Aunt Rosa Amalia or his Uncle Carlos and get his mother's number. Then Enrique will call back and get the number from his old boss. To make the two calls, he will require two telephone cards 
at 50 pesos apiece. When he phones his mother, he'll call collect. He cannot beg 100 pesos. He will have to get work. For migrant children and teens, there are few options. Shining shoes, selling gum or candy on the sidewalk, or washing cars. He'll wash cars. Each evening, without fail, Enrique goes to the Nuevo Laredo City Hall with a large plastic paint bucket and two rags. It costs It takes courage to go. He knows he could get caught. From a spigot on the side of the building, he fills a bucket. He goes to parking lots across the street from a bustling taco stand. Unlike workers at at other businesses, those at the taco stand do not run him off. One of his rags is red. Each time someone arrives to eat dinner, he waves the red rag to guide the customer into a parking space, like a ground crew member ushering a jetliner to its arrival gate. Usually there is competition. Two or three other migrants set up their buckets along the same sidewalk. A woman in a blue dress pulls into a parking space in a white Pontiac Bonneville. May I wash your windows? Enrique asks. She nods and walks toward the taco stand. Enrique wipes the front of the car, then the side windows, moving his hand with its fingers splayed across a rag in quick, ever-growing circles. He walks around the car, wiping and wiping. He cleans inside, even the floorboards. The moon is out, but it is ninety degrees. Sweat trickles down his face. He must finish before the woman's tacos are ready. She returns, fumbles for her car keys, gets in, then puts two coins, three and a half pesos, in his hand. Gracias, he says. Most drivers turn down his services. He sighs. In eight hours, scrambling after every car that pulls in, he makes only twenty pesos, about two dollars. The air around the taco stand fills with the aroma of barbecue. Enrique watches workers pull strips of meat from a vat, put them on a large chopping box, and cut them up. Customers sit at long stainless steel tables and eat. Sometimes, when the stand closes, the servers slip him a couple of tacos. A lifeline. Otherwise, for his only meal every day, Enrique depends on the Parroquia de San Jose, or St. Joseph's Parish. The parish church gives food cards to migrants. The cards are like gold. Sometimes they are stolen or sold for money. Migrants who bathe in the river leave their cards on the bank and carry rocks into the water to throw at anyone who tries to take them. When the, with the card from this and a second church, Enrique can count on one meal a day for 15 days. The priest at the parroquia de San Jose is Father Leonardo López Guajardo, known as Padre Leo. In Nuevo Laredo, Padre Leo is not a typical priest. Other priests in town wear nice watches and rings and act important. Padre Leo is so disheveled that visitors sometimes mistake him for one of the poor, dirty migrants sitting outside. He wears the same pants for days, stained and dirty from hauling boxes of ripe vegetables, food for the migrants. His favorite pair has frayed cuffs and a small tear in the rear. During Mass, Padre Leo doesn't read from the Bible much. He conveys his message through jokes or by spinning a lesson out of a popular song or movie. He does not stand at the altar. He paces up and down the church's, the church aisle's pink floor in his white robe, which he wears with broken-down sneakers. As he paces, he mops copious quantities of sweat from his balding head with a large white towel. A microphone in his left hand, the towel in his right, he preaches. He is humble and lives modestly. He gives his salary to the church to help it pay staff salaries. When someone gave him a nice truck, he sold it to pay church utility bills. His car which he rarely drives to save gas and to help the environment, is a tiny Mazda purchased for $400. The driver's door won't open from the outside. The vinyl dash is shredded, and the front seat has a huge hole in it. He prefers to pick up donations of bread and clothing on his rickety blue bicycle. Either we are with the poor or we are not. God teaches us to help the poor. Any other interpretation is unacceptable, he says. To Padre Leo, the people most in need in Nuevo Laredo are migrants. They go for days without food, for months without resting their heads on a pillow, and they are defenseless against an onslaught of abuses. His vow is to restore a bit of their dignity. He saw that these people are the most vulnerable, the most disliked by the local population, so he gave himself to them, says a church volunteer. Padre Leo gave up the two-bedroom priest's apartment attached to the church so that female migrants would have a safe place to sleep. He settled himself into a tiny room off the pantry. A steady stream of migrants flows into the church. Padre Leo attends to them one by one. He takes down each individual's information, then gives him or her a meal card. He helps arrange to pick up money wired by relatives in the United States. To help the migrants look more presentable, he gives away most of the few shoes and clothes he owns. He brings a hair cutter to the church. A doctor treats the migrants' illnesses for free. 
If they need blood, Padre Leo is the first to donate. Some parishioners thought the priest was crazy to attract what they saw as bums and delinquents to their neighborhood. They objected to helping migrants at all. This was a good neighborhood until you brought your people, they complained. What if some of them were dangerous criminals fleeing prosecution in their own countries? Meanwhile, their church, one of the poorest in the city, was falling apart. The pews were decrepit and the padre hadn't installed air conditioning, despite summer temperatures that reach 120 degrees. A church survey showed that many parishioners didn't attend church because of the migrants. Once, the local director of La Migra threatened to lock up the priest for several years on smuggling charges if he didn't bar migrants from entering his church. Padre Leo promised to behave and then ignored the warning. Now three-quarters of the people in his parish agree with his work. We should say thanks that we don't have to go through this, but maybe with a bit of bread, a smile, you can lessen their load, a volunteer says. Without the church's help, she adds, the migrants would be even more desperate and the impact on the city would be worse. The volunteer who cooks dinner for migrants daily says, Padre Leo has taught me to give to others without expecting anything in return. Each night, like clockwork, Letty Limon, a volunteer, swings open the church's yellow double doors. Who's new? she calls out. Me, me. Migrants, men and boys, cry out from the courtyard. They all rush to the door, jostling one another to get in. Get in line, get in line, Limon shouts. She is poor herself. She cleans houses across the river in Texas for $20 apiece, but she has helped to feed these migrants for a year and a half, figuring that Jesus would approve. She issues the newcomers beige cards and punches the cards of those who enter. A parish priest counts 6% children. One by one, the migrants stand behind the chairs at a long table. At the head is a mural of Jesus, his hands extended toward the plates of tacos, tomatoes, and beans. Above Jesus are his words, Come to me, all you who are weary, and find life burdensome. The lights dim, and two big fans spin to a stop so everyone can hear grace. In the still air, the room turns hot, nearly suffocating. Perspiration trickles down the migrants' faces and soaks their shirts. A volunteer or one of the migrants begins the short prayer. Some who have not eaten in days grab at bread before they have finished saying grace. A volunteer asks everyone to remove their hats, to please eat everything on their trays, or give it to someone near them. Chairs screech as everyone pulls them out at once. Spoons of stew touch lips before bottoms hit the seats. There are more migrants than chairs. Some eat standing, others squat on the floor, plates balanced on their knees. They eat in quiet desperation, and a clatter of forks against plates Beans, stew, tomatoes, rice, and donuts appear. Afterward, opposite a portrait of the Virgin of Guadalupe, about a dozen of the migrants always gather around a map of Texas. It is covered in plastic, but fingerprints have blackened parts of it anyway. They discuss the state of the river. Is it high? Low? They tell how they will get to the Texas crossing the Rio Grande. Companionship at church dinners, Enrique meets other teenagers who hope to reach their mothers in the United States. A 16-year-old boy, Hermes Galliano, is stuck, too. He and Enrique compare stories. Both are from Honduras. Both have been robbed. As with Enrique, bandits on top of a train struck Hermes in the face with a board. It tore out his front teeth, leaving two black holes. As with Enrique, the bandits left Hermes in his underwear, sobbing and bloody. They ripped up the scrap of paper with his mother's phone number on it, too, and tossed it to the wind. This is Hermes's third attempt to reach his mother. Hermes's mother left when he was ten. She sent money, five letters, and fifteen photos. She called as often as she could afford to. It was not enough. He wanted to be with her. My mom told me she loves me. No one else ever told me that, Hermes says. Enrique and Hermes make another friend, a fifteen-year-old girl, Mary Gabriela Posas Isaguere, Isaguire or Gabby, as she prefers to be called. She tells them her story. Her mother, who was divorced, struggled to keep Gabby and her two brothers fed. Her mother sold most of what she had, tables, beds, pots, and pans, to send the children to school. Finally, one afternoon in July 1999, Gabby came home from school to find only a note. I'm going for a little while. I'm going to work very hard. Her mother left Gabby's older brother in charge and asked the children to pray three times a day before they ate, slept, or went outside. Gabby and her brothers ached for her. They began sleeping in her bed to feel near to her. Gabby would drift off smelling her mother's scent on the pillow. She missed feeling cared for. 
She dreamed that her mother was at home, scolding her in the morning, telling her to get to school on time. She imagined that they were going to the park. She missed teasing her for playing old fogey music, Beethoven. The house felt sad, empty, Gabby says. Every time the telephone rang, Gabby raced to answer it. When are you coming home, she begged her mother. Then she turned harsh. Why did you bring us into the world if you were going to leave us? Of 48 children in her class, 36 had a parent in the United States, most often a mother. At her new home in the northeastern United States, Gabby's mother cleaned houses and babysat two toddlers. One day she sent Gabby a Barbie doll. The toddlers had already torn open the box. Gabby seethed. She sat alone, envisioning her mother playing with these other children. On the telephone, Gabby and her mother argued. I'm taking care of other kids instead of you. Can you imagine what that's like? Her mother demanded. You don't know what I've suffered. Gabby didn't believe her. All she wanted was to be with her. Winter came. Her mother called, crying. She was sick, lonely, and out of a job. I knew I had to go, Gabby said. I thought, I'm young. I want to help her so she can come home. By Christmas of 1999, going to the United States had become an obsession. Her mother was terrified that Gabby would make the trip alone. She could be raped. Gabby's 26-year-old aunt, Lourdes Isaguirre, Isaguirre, decided to take the journey with her. Together, they figured they might be less vulnerable. Gabby left behind her brothers. Gabby's, older, Gabby's aunt, Lourdes, walked away from her children, ages 5 and 10, and two younger siblings she was raising. She left all of them with her own mother. Back home, Aunt Lourdes was paid $30 a week for making Tommy Hilfiger labeled shirts. Even working full-time, she could not make enough to feed them all. A smuggler promised to deliver Gabby and Aunt Lourdes for $2,000 up front, but he robbed and abandoned them in Chapachula, just inside the southern border of Mexico. They were deported to Guatemala. The two resolved to try again. This time, they would hike through the Lacandon jungle in the Mexican state of Chiapas. Gabby and Aunt Lourdes spent days washing people's clothes along the Usumacinta River in exchange for food. They asked every smuggler who went by if he would take them through the mountain pass. The smugglers demanded sex in exchange. Angrily, Gabby refused. Finally, four smugglers let them tag along with a group of 80 migrants who Gabby learned had paid between five and $8,000 apiece. They put her up front to help cut a path in the jungle's dense vegetation. Gabby rebuffed constant demands for sex. She tried to look as ugly as possible. She hardly slept, never smiled or combed her hair. Her legs turned black with ticks. She felt as though bugs were eating her alive, but she dared not lift her skirt to remove them. She kept repeating to herself, I have to get to my mother. She and Aunt Lourdes switched to hitchhiking, but a migra agent caught them trying to walk toward a checkpoint. The agent was a woman, Gabby says, who ordered them to strip and checked their clothing for hidden cash. The agent scolded them for having so little money. If you can't pay me, why should I release you? She wanted to know. Please let us go, Gabby begged. I'm going to help my mother. Vayanse, go, the agent said. Finally, Gabby and Aunt Lourdes made it to Nuevo Laredo. Gabby tells Enrique she feels stuck here, too. Sometimes, she says, lowering her voice, she feels like she wants to die. Aunt Lourdes begins to cry. I feel bad for doing this. It wasn't worth it. I'd rather starve with my children, but I've come this far. I can't go back. She mortgaged her property and borrowed money from a neighbor in her, for her journey. Her voice, her voice turns firm again. I can't go back empty-handed. Gabby puts her arm around her aunt. Outside the church after dinner, many migrants engage in a twisted kind of street therapy. Who has endured the worst, riding the trains? They measure trips not in days, but in shoes lost, beatings taken, belongings robbed. They show off scars. I walked four days. I walked 28 days. The air feet covered in large blisters, toenails that have turned up from walking. A young man sits on a green metal bench outside the church. He has been stuck here for weeks, and he trumps everyone. He slides up a leg of his black jeans and takes off a high-topped black sneaker, then a prosthesis. His right calf tapers into a pink stump.